Welcome back, Dr. Milo Wolf here, PhD in Sports Science with Wolf Coaching, reviewing GVS's five favorite hypertrophy movements that have been slept on. Now, I've never interacted with GVS too much personally, but from what I've seen, I gotta admit, I'm kind of a fan. I like the personality, and even though he doesn't come from a strictly evidence-based perspective, Generally, he actually gives pretty good advice, and I think we see eye to eye on most things. Plus, dude is pretty jacked, so what's not to like? Fun fact, GVS also almost moderated the debate between natural hypertrophy and myself. Keep in mind throughout this reaction that I'm coming at this from a sports science perspective versus a more applied perspective potentially. So without further ado, let me give you my two cents. What's up peeps, back with another video. So today we're talking about five exercises that are not particularly popular and are often vilified that I really, really like and I've gotten not just enjoyment from, but results from as well. So let's jump right into it. And number one, we have rack pulls. Now, as everyone knows, I'm a big fan of rack pulls. I think they are excellent. I think they actually get the job done a lot more than people think. Now, whenever I post a picture of my rack pulls or a video of my rack pulls, uh, I actually get a lot of comments like SFR bad, bad SFR, uh, low stimulus, I have a dig, uh, bad SFR, SFR bad. And I think this stems from powerlifting because for powerlifting, I do think that the rack pull, especially higher up, is not going to be particularly valuable. If you look at the sticking point for most people in the deadlift, it is fairly early in the movement. It's a fairly low sticking point. So sometimes right off the floor, sometimes a little bit off the floor, maybe mid shin, somewhere around there. But people are usually not failing a deadlift around the knees or higher. First things first, I agree that the rack pull is not going to be a good powerlifting accessory. I, I hope no one's really making that claim too much. There are going to be cases where it might be, but on average, it's not the best powerlifting accessory. With that being said, while I do appreciate the lightheartedness with which he is addressing the commenters on YouTube, I get why this movement is unpopular, and I think it should be, and here's why. I'm just not really sure what you're really training with the rack pull. For the hip extensors, that is to say the glutes, adductors, and hamstrings, you're training them in that sort of peak contraction position, which for muscle growth, probably not ideal. The forearms, usually you'll be using straps anyways, so the forearms are unlikely to be trained close enough to failure for it to be very effective. And then finally, there's really only two muscle groups I can think of where it has some use, and that would be the upper traps and the erector spinae muscle, the muscle that's responsible for extending your spine. Let's cut to the chase. With the erector spinae muscle, the muscle responsible for keeping your back straight, with the moment arms involved in the rack pull being very small, I don't think you'll be training them that close to failure. And I think the upper traps are almost always going to be the limiting factor. But then when it comes to the upper traps, the question has to be asked, why are you doing a rack pull versus just an isometric hold at the top? Because ultimately your upper traps are not moving around during the rack pull anyways. So why go through the motion of getting the bar off the rack in the first place if all you're doing the movement for is the upper traps and they're just being held isometrically at long muscle lengths. So essentially, to me, the only function of the rack pull here is to have the upper traps be stretched out isometrically with a decent load. But then the question is, why are you doing the rack pull as opposed to just an isometric hold? And then that comes down to a question of, are isometrics inherently worse for hypertrophy than dynamic contractions, where you're actually lifting the weight up and down like in a shrug? The answer there is, we just don't fully know yet from a science perspective. But personally, rather than rack pull, I would much rather someone just straight up do an isometric hold at long muscle lengths or do partials or what have you because the rack pull isn't really adding anything to it as far as hypertrophy goes. If they are, usually it's because they got out of position to sacrifice strength later in the movement to get more strength earlier in the movement. This is usually from rounding the back in some place, which, you know, is fine if you're used to that uh, and if you can brace effectively. Um, but that doesn't mean that a rack pull is really going to help your deadlift in most cases. So yes, for a power lifter, especially if you are very, very strong, rack pulls are going to have a not great stimulus because it's not very specific to what you're trying to accomplish, and they will have a lot of fatigue as well. However, I tend to do rack pulls for quite high reps, and I don't care about my deadlift. So that's not really a goal. I'm trying to get my back thick and juicy. And if you think about it, what works the back when you are deadlifting? Well, it's it's this type of action, you know, where your shoulders are forward, your upper back is rounded, and then you have to bring those shoulders back. 
you know? So this is actually working the traps because of the weighted stretch and not just the upper traps, but you know, the lower and the middle traps to get the, that chest raising action. It's almost like a front squat in some ways. It's going to work the lats quite a bit more than a lot of people think because your shoulders are, are tucked forward and you're trying to keep the bar close like that is still lats. It's not a length in movement, but it is still absolutely working the lats. And then the spinal erectors, it's fantastic for those because you're not quite isolating them, but you're using them just as much as a normal deadlift, but you're sort of taking the lower body to a certain extent out of it. So I don't really agree with the claim here that the lats or mid traps or lower traps or rhomboids are being trained particularly well here. Ultimately, in the rack pull, just like the deadlift, the force vector that you're training against is going straight down. Meanwhile, your rhomboids, mid traps, lower traps are essentially responsible for bringing your shoulder blades back. So these muscle groups, their force vector is essentially acting at a 90 degree angle or perpendicularly to the force vector that you're working against. That is to say the function of the lower and mid traps and the rhomboids is essentially unresisted. So yes, you can absolutely feel your lats and upper back by just going like this, just like you would when you're flexing or posing, for example, but the rack pull still doesn't really target the lats or mid traps or lower traps or rhomboids effectively at all, in my opinion. And for the record, I think that that lift is one of the most overrated movements when it comes to the back as a whole. Does it train your hamstrings, glutes, and adductors very effectively? Absolutely. Does it provide some stimulus for your erectors? Absolutely. But does it really train the lats, mid traps, rhomboids, lower traps well at all? I really don't think so. I would take an actual vertical pulling variation or a rowing variation over a deadlift for the back any day of the week. You're still working the hamstrings and glutes to extend the hips a little bit, but because the movement is almost done when you're starting around the knees, you can really just focus on using the back a lot more proportionately compared to a deadlift. And so I get the sort of, oh, you must be a juicer, look at your traps. Well, a lot of that is from letting my traps and my shoulders, everything round forward and stretch forward during a deadlift. I'm trying to finish the movement as low as possible. So I'm trying to lock out around my knees if I can. I can because my arms are pretty long, but not that long, but I'm trying to really lengthen and stretch everything out in the upper back. Look, I like the emphasis on the stretch position and what have you here. That's all great. What I'll say though, is that from the videos he's showing here, he's not really intentionally flexing his back all that much not to the extent of really getting a stretch in his erector spinning muscles. And look, personally, I have actually trained my erectors before, but just on a machine where you can actually flex and extend the spine a lot more easily than you would during a deadlift or a rack pull. So he's for sure getting some erector stimulus here. I just don't think it's a great movement for targeting the erectors unless you modify it heavily to really emphasize movement at the spine. Like you wouldn't do a curl just going from here to here. So in the same way, in the rack pull, if all you do is essentially use the same technique as here, you're not really targeting your erectors maximally well. Ultimately, the erectors are the same as any other muscle group. So train them the same way. So if you want a big deadlift, don't do these. If you want big hamstrings, big glutes, don't do these. You know, these are more contraction focused. But for that upper back, it actually is a lengthened focus movement because you're really stretching everything out. And then unlike a row where you're really trying to contract everything, you are actually not quite getting to that fully contracted position. So I would say for upper back, these have been, these have been very, very effective. And so try them out. Number two, the Arnold press. Now these are often vilified because people will look at the anatomy of the front delt and they will say, oh, this, this doesn't do anything. So just start here and then just do a normal seated dumbbell overhead press. Uh, I get that, and I think if you only wanted to maximize front delt hypertrophy, that would make sense, because you're not really getting much of a stretch on the front delt here. You are a little bit, but what I find is that these are great for traps. So another good trap movement, because you have to be almost like shrugged down here, and then you're rotating back, which is working a lot of traps. It's working more side delt, I found, as well. And it's okay to choose a movement that is not working a specific muscle or part of the muscle as quote unquote optimally as something else. You can choose general exercises. You can choose an exercise that is working several different muscle groups pretty good. You know, it's not maybe the best for any particular area, 
but you can't really have a program that is really digging deep into every single muscle because you'd be doing like 80 exercises, okay? It's fine to choose exercises that are more general and less specific, and I would include the Arnold Press in this because you're working, yes, the front delt, but also the side delt, even a little bit of rear delt from this, like, this kind of action. People will look at EMG or something like that, but I have found, you know, I've gotten sore rear delts from that, from just from stabilizing, and it's almost like you're pushing back. You know, on an, on an overhead press, you're pushing up. With these ones, you're rotating, and it's like the sticking point is up here. I know, I know it pissed down, I don't give a fuck. Um, but this lockout is very, very challenging, and, you know, I have found these to be overall very, very effective. All right, first of all, I respect the honesty and the commitment and the lack of care about the pit stain. We've all been there. Um, regarding the arm press for the shoulders, doing this during the movement doesn't really change anything about the movement. It's still gonna be a good front delt movement, but I do question what this motion essentially is adding to the stimulus of the front delts, the side delts, etc. because ultimately the path of the upper arm remains relatively unchanged. Yeah, you might be changing the length of different muscles slightly based on internal external rotation of the shoulder or what have you, but it's not going to be a big difference. And certainly I don't think the rear delts are getting any stimulus from the Arnold press, no more at least than you would during a traditional seated dumbbell overhead press. So Arnold press, it's relatively unpopular. It's a fine movement. It's not my favorite, but it's a fine movement. So I'll give this Thumbs up for the most part. We are at that stage of YouTube fitness, by the way, where a thumbs up is my honest critique of this take. Number three are dumbbell pullovers. Now, I really, really like these. I don't do them the same way as natural hypertrophy does. He does them sort of lying across the bench, which, you know, might allow you to sort of open up a little bit more and to lean back. Um, but I like to do them on the bench. So where you're lying on the same direction as the bench, you're on the bench. Um, just because I find it to provide a little bit more stability. And I also like to dig my head into the bench as I go back, um, which also gets a little bit of neck work as well at the same time. Now, some people might say, oh, this is not a lat exercise. It's not working the lats. Yeah, I don't know about that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to call bullshit on that. You know, people will cite, you know, some biomechanical study or, or EMG or something. But I mean, if you can feel the lat stretch as you go back, I think it's stretching the lats. You know, what people will try to gaslight you, You're like, no, no, you're not, you're not feeling the lat. You're feeling, you're feeling the oblique or the rib cage or the serratus or the abs or something else or the rear delt. I know when I'm feeling my lat, okay? You know, stop, stop, just stop, stop. So, first of all, I agree that dumbbell pullover is a phenomenal lat exercise. I have a whole video on that somewhere here. It's the best lat exercise in my opinion. Now, I don't think I arrived at that conclusion through the same means as Jeffrey here did. I don't think relying on the feel during a muscle is really a good way to go about determining what exercise is better. Ultimately, for a lot of movements, for example, that top squeeze position might feel amazing. Like, shit, me just doing this now, I feel my biceps. Does that mean that me just holding it like this is going to provide a maximum growth stimulus? No. In fact, I might feel this more than certain movements at some points during the exercise. And so how you feel during an exercise only correlates relatively weakly, in my view, to how effective it is for hypertrophy. If you don't get any feeling in the target muscle during an exercise, might that be something you want to pay attention to? Sure. But just because you feel an exercise a little bit more than another doesn't mean that exercise is necessarily better. Now, with regards to the biomechanics and EMG claims, I absolutely agree. Ultimately, we have a pretty substantial body of evidence suggesting that, hey, if you want to maximize muscle growth, training in the stretch position is a good thing. The dumbbell pullover does just that. And the claim that it's all chest due to differences in inter internal leverage between the pec and the lats at the bottom of a pullover. The truth is, we just don't have evidence to suggest that that is actually how it plays out when it comes to hypertrophy. Like, if you take a step to failure, does that mean that only the pecs are going to be taken to failure? Or does that mean your body's gonna go, hey, we need to extend the shoulders, let's recruit all the muscles we can to accomplish that job. My hunch is it's the latter. And therefore, when you're taking a step close to failure, even if your pecs have slightly better leverage, you will get a robust hypertrophy effect. Importantly, if someone's making the claim that the pullover or the pull down is all pecs or all tears major or what have you, just keep in mind, there is no direct evidence to support that claim. To my knowledge, very few, if any studies, have actually measured hypertrophy as an outcome of differences in internal leverage. Not feeling your chest in the bench press, you're feeling your quads. And we are all built a little bit differently. The shoulder joint is a complicated one. So it's possible that some people feel more chest when they're doing this movement. Some people might feel more rear delts. Some people might feel 
more lats. Some people might feel more triceps, you know, so there's a lot of different areas that can actually provide shoulder extension from that extremely extended position. And so, yeah, this could be working in multiple areas, but again, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I've also found these are actually pretty good as a sort of bulletproofing exercise. Um, you know, if you can't do dumbbell pullovers because you feel really unstable in that fully extended position, you should probably do dumbbell pullovers, you know, because these are actually going to be a good movement. Just start light, start controlled. You might want to add a pause in that fully lengthened position. And if you are weak in that area, you're going to want to strengthen that area. So often when I get a client and they're like, I cannot do this exercise, I'm thinking, <laughs> I know what we're going to be doing. Not always, you know, sometimes it just doesn't make any sense. But I think often if someone is getting pain from a movement or they just don't feel comfortable with that movement or their range of motion, they should probably be doing that movement, you know, just building up, starting with lighter weights. And, you know, if your body is so sensitive that it's giving you pain from a pretty basic range of motion, you know, I think nothing super extreme. Uh, I think, you know, for your own just durability and, and injury prevention, you should probably build up that area and that tolerance to stress in those positions. So purely anecdotally here, injury prevention, pain management, not my expertise. I will say when I train more in the lengthened position, and sure, I'm biased if you want to claim that, but I have found personally that generally my joints just feel a bit better if I'm exposed more regularly to the lengthened position. I'm not making claims that there is definitely an effect here. It's just how I felt. Next up, we have machine squats. Now, full disclosure, I used to be in the gym like four, five, six years ago, you know, doing my barbell squats like a fucking small legged champion over here. And I'd see someone using machine squats and I'd be like, <laughs> fucking pussy. <laughs> really? Like that was actually my mindset. Just like, look at this guy. He's using a machine. He's using a machine. I'm over here with my little twigs squatting up a storm with my barbell. And ironically, when I hurt my QL and I couldn't do barbell squats and I couldn't do barbell deadlifts and I couldn't do these basic movements, it was the single best year of quad training that I had had since my first year of lifting. In fact, it might have even been better than my first year of lifting. And I made a lot of progress from working in movements that I would never have dreamt of doing before. And so I really do recommend getting injured. Or you can learn from other people's mistakes, right? It's cool how... How that can work you don't have to snap your shit up in order to unlock some some dope variations so i actually find that these are a lot more stable you don't have to worry about you know unracking or re-racking or you know stabilizing or balance or any of that and you know i have some imbalances in the hips and these are just way 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 more productive plus i can keep it much more quad dominant um, you actually can see in the videos where my hips are coming off the pad. I get asked about this a lot. It will visualize what would happen if I kept my hips on the pad. So the pad would actually drag my hips down, making it more hip dominant and less quad dominant. So from the very first moment I did this movement, I just allowed my hips to drift off the pad. From the very first rep, I never thought, oh, I need to keep, keep my hips on the pad because... I tried that when someone suggested, they're like, you're doing it wrong. And it felt like some kind of like shitty good morning. No, I want the knees to go forward. And if I the knees are going to go forward, the hips have to go forward with them. And so those are, you know, your hips are actually connected to your knees. I don't know if you know that. They're actually, there's actually a, a what do they call it? A femur down there. Might be pronounced femur. So I do agree with the machine squat or any sort of machine for the quads actually being pretty effective. Like... For a lot of people, it allows them to minimize the loading on the spine, work in higher rep ranges because it's less systemically fatiguing. It can be a nice way to work around some pain potentially if you have some lower back pain. And depending on how the machine is built, it can allow you to get deeper, get a better stretch, etc. So by and large, I do agree. And in this case, it also looks like the way he's performing it, where he's not letting his hips come up against the pad, just allows his back to stay a little bit more vertical, get a little bit deeper in knee flexion, overall making it a potentially better quad movement. Another thing I like about these is that they actually force the lift to be more quad dominant as you get closer to failure. Often with a barbell back squat or even, you know, front squat, 
or even a Smith Machine hack squat, as you get closer to failure, the instinct will be to shift the hips back and to use more posterior chain or even the erectors to get the bar up, especially if you have these long ass femurs. But for these, as you get closer to failure, actually you'll feel like you want to shift the knees forward. And so I actually think that this is a good thing because there's no temptation to shift the hips back. I wouldn't say these are unpopular, but I will say that they are a little bit underappreciated and a lot of people, even powerlifters, could benefit from including these in their programming. Finally, we have side bends. Now, these are something that are often viewed as dangerous for some reason. I'm not entirely sure why. Um, if you find these to be dangerous, uh, you're probably just not very conditioned to moving side to side. There's no reason why moving side to side a little bit should be dangerous. It's only going to be dangerous if you've never really moved side to side, which is entirely possible if you're on a typical bodybuilding plan and you're sedentary the rest of the time. If you have, you know, any type of athletic movement or, or wrestling or something where you're twisting and turning, these will seem like a complete joke. But I think for a lot of people, these are going to be a good conditioning movement. You can easily build up pretty heavy. And another area that I think people won't realize is being targeted are your spinal erectors. So they're not just responsible for erections. Er, er, mm. Phrasing. Hey, phrase it! Editor, cut that out. It's, it's highly inappropriate. We can't have that kind of stuff on Jeffrey Verity Scoville's YouTube channel. Unacceptable. So the spinal erectors are not just responsible for erecting the spine, but they are also responsible for actually bringing the spine upright from a sideways position. Right, so when you're in this position, you're actually stretching the spinal erectors. You know, so these are actually a pretty decent spinal erector movement, um, as well as for the obliques. People often do them for the obliques. Yes, the obliques are working, but it's not just the oblique that performs this action. I found that when you go heavy as well, like 100 pounds or more, it also provides a pretty good stretch for like the upper back and the mid traps. Um, and so it's a, just a pretty good all-around movement. I think it's good for injury prevention. Plus, I think that if you have hip imbalances or leg length imbalances, this is a really, really good sort of insurance policy because you might actually find that one leg is moving a little bit differently. And so it'll work the adductors slightly. It'll work the glute medius slightly. You'll, you'll feel that entire hip area lighting up, especially if you do, you know, sets of 20 or 25 or sets of 30. And so, yeah, I think there is value to be provided here. I don't think it's particularly dangerous. I think that if you feel like you're going to snap your shit up from doing this, you should probably do this. So, do I think the side bend is an exercise you need to include? No. I think it will work the obliques. Ultimately, your external obliques, the muscle on the side of your abs, but those are actually also involved in spinal flexion. So essentially any movement that trains your ab muscle, like a crunch, a dragon flag, a, a wheel rollout or anything else, will also train the obliques reasonably well. And that's why in most programs, you do not see any isolation exercise or lateral flexion exercise for the obliques specifically, simply because they do get a decent stimulus from other movements. And so I wouldn't claim the side bend is this perfect exercise that you need to include. It's fine if you want to grow bigger obliques, but otherwise there's no need. What I'll say regarding the whole pain and injury stuff, and in general, this is a trend throughout the whole video, I like that he's not fear mongering about exercises because it's a pitfall a lot of influencers fall into, but equally, I don't like making the claim without evidence that hey training with this exercise might bulletproof you or might prevent injury i just don't think we have the evidence to claim that with any confidence and actually louis simmons used to promote these may he rest in peace and i think he was probably onto something here i think that even for powerlifters there's probably a lot of value to be gained actually ed cohen also recommended doing like holds with the side bend like with a barbell so he's holding onto the barbell in a, in a power rack you know, and, and not necessarily doing reps, but just doing it, you know, holding it for time. And, you know, that really does give you that ability to brace, which I think in particular, if you have muscle imbalances in the hips, in the lower back, etc., are, it's probably going to be a good idea to include. And there are, of course, other movements that you can do to work that similar movement pattern, that similar functionality, those areas, you know, in the obliques and the side, 
you could do side planks with your feet up on a bench and then, you know, dip your hips that way. I used to do that as a runner, super high reps, 70, 80, 90, 100 reps at a time, really burning out that sort of hip and entire side area. You could do a pallet press. So where the cable is coming from the side and then you push out, stay braced, hold it, go back in, push out, stay braced, hold it. And so your, your torso isn't moving. It's, it's only your hands and staying braced. You could do like a wood chopper, high to low, low to high. And it always struck me as a little bit hypocritical where if you do a wood chop, a limb chopper or whatever it's called, people are like, yeah, right on Instagrammable. And then you do this with a dumbbell and, and people just lose their shit. I agree. I think that people often fear monger different exercises like, oh, the side bend or oh, the deadlift or what have you. Just don't. Anyways, that was my review of Jeffrey Verity Scofield's five favorite movements for hypertrophy that are unpopular. Overall, honestly, I've said it before, but I'm kind of a fan of Jeffrey Verity Scofield, even though our viewpoints kind of collide or clash in some ways. Like I'd give this a seven or eight out of 10, which considering his background being more of an applied guy is really solid. And in general, I think he is more attuned to advancements in hypertrophy research than people give them credit for sometimes. Anyways, that's the video. If you enjoyed the video, leave a comment down below letting me know who else you want to see me react to. Like the video, subscribe. If you'd like me to coach you, check out the link above and you have a great day and I'll see you next time. Peace. What I'll say though, what was he saying again? Um, shit. Oh yeah, there you go.